Hi there, and welcome to a brand new series of Bike File. That's right, we're back. And over the next 12 episodes, we're going to be bringing you the definitive buyer's guide to every motorcycle you have ever thought of owning. We're going to check out sports bikes, tourers, commuters, retros, the lot. And we're going to rate them all for value for money, comfort, build quality, performance, you name it, we're going to check it out. And for this episode, it is the turn of the Italian Stallions. Have you ever thought of going Italian? Well, if you have, come with us and let's see what's on offer. Louise will be nipping along the high streets on an Italjet Jupiter, while Rod will be reviewing a Moto Guzzi. And we'll also be giving you our top tips for buying the very best of Italian motorcycles. And now it's time for us to meet our first motorcycle of the day on this rather chilly, incredibly bright morning. Now you've got to feel sorry for Ducati. There they were with an awesome performing modern classic in the shape of their 998, yet they knew eventually something would have to change. Change. There's something us human beings fear the most. So you just knew that when the object being changed was as close to our hearts and daydreaming minds as the old Ducati 998, that when the replacement came out there would be an almighty wailing and gnashing of teeth. And there was, because here it is, the replacement of the Ducati 999. Let's get the formalities out of the way first. This bike ain't anywhere near as purdy as the 916, 996, 998 family, and nor is it likely to achieve their timeless majesty either. But who cares? We could argue semantics on styling all day long, but personally, I'd rather get on with riding the bikes rather than jawing about them. Climb aboard the 999, and you know straight away that this is a completely different animal to its predecessor. It is longer, it is slightly lower, and it is altogether a damn sight more comfortable. Yes, the 998's famous torture rack riding position that both Ducati and osteopaths around the world have been making fortunes out of for years now is at last gone. This definitely is a Ducati you can actually spend time on away from the racetrack without needing a hot bath and a brace of masseurs to look after you upon your return. But up the ante and you'll still find that despite the new and improved bonus comfort, you're still in just the right position on board for Banzai track attack when necessary. The 999 retains the mind-bending mid-corner poise of its predecessors. No other production sports bike feels as safe at silly lean angles as one of these. Best thing about the 999's handling though is although the mid-corner abilities are still impeccable, where every incarnation of the predecessor from the 916 onwards needed a serious amount of body weight to actually get it turned in the first place, the 999 now flicks in with the lightest of nudges on the inside bar and then proceeds to happily hug the kerb all the way to the spot on apex of your choice. Precision and sweet steering. Whatever next. The gearbox is prone to the odd false neutral here and there when you're tramping on at the track. On the road it's not so much of a problem, but if you are on to thrashing your mates on a track day, Make sure you use a firm left boot to avoid any embarrassing misgears. If we were poking around for another downside to this bike, it would be the question of noise. Or rather, the lack of it. This bike is quite simply far too quiet for a great big red V-twin. To be honest, the sound is more of an apology than a boom that comes out of that exhaust. Otherwise, the 999 is absolutely bang on. And as for the looks, get over it, will ya? This bike outrides the one it replaces and it ain't going away, so get used to it. Now, let's see how it stacks up overall. Performance, 10 out of 10. Quite simply, this bike is a stunning package of handling and power and braking. Styling, 7 out of 10. I like this bike more and more every time I see it. But that said, it's not going to be any great beauty like its predecessor. Comfort, 7 out of 10. Quite amazingly, the most comfortable super sports Ducati ever. Not the torture rack that the old models were, very well improved. Reliability. We're going to sit on the fence here and go with a 5 out of 10 because the bike simply hasn't been out long enough to be proven yet. But the old models were getting better and better. If you do want one of these though, make sure you do spend money on proper servicing. Value for money. 7 out of 10, but only if you're loaded. 11 and a half grand is a lot of money for a motorcycle. That said, if you can afford it, you get an awesome package. Well, that's quite enough of the Ducati 999 for one day. But if looks really are your thing, then stick with us because later in the show, we're going to be riding MV's Drop Dead Gorgeous Augusta, perhaps the most beautiful bike to come out of Italy in the last decade. But for now, here's Louise with Italjet's funky little Jupiter. Thanks, Ron. Now let's talk scooters. Italjet, in fact, who haven't had the best reputation in the world for building quality scooters. 
they have provided us with some outstanding designs but the problem is some of the bikes have failed to stand up in real world situations you see they look great in the showrooms but get them out there on their open road and bits have been known to literally fall off but that could all be about to change because their latest is the Italia Jupiter and this is the Italian company's entry into that super scooter market. It's one of those comfy twist and go millennium bikes that's capable of crossing continents. The Jupiter portrays a similar image to that of the Yamaha Majesty, the bike from which the Italia borrows its engine. That's a torquey 250 four-stroke single, which won't set the tarmac alight with its slightly sluggish nature, but does retain a degree of fluidity, maintaining a smooth ride and keeping the Jupiter predictable. Now let's take a closer look first at this enormous saddle. You know, the seat height on this bike is a lowly 73 centimetres, which means virtually any height, male or female, will have absolutely no problem climbing aboard this rather hefty 150 kilo scooter. Now, sit on it a few kilos more, and it's easy to see why Italjet saw fit to equip this bike with decent sized disc brakes front and rear, the front being 250 mil in diameter. I'm sure that's quite enough to stop this chunky little scoot. Once back on the move, you realise the advantages of these large twist and go machines. You sit low, well protected from the elements by that large fairing and screen. Now your feet are slightly up and forwards and the riding position is more custom cruiser than super scooter. Fitting the Jupiter with a Yamaha engine is definitely a leap forwards for the company in terms of reliability. And the rest of this bike does feel relatively well put together. That's relative compared to the other Italjet bikes in the range. And that's probably because this bike is built in China and not Italy. And with that in mind, parts and accessories should be far more easier to get hold of. So let's take a look how the bike measures up with the scores on the doors. Performance 6 out of 10. The Yamaha motor does feel a little sluggish at low speeds but gets there in the end. But it's a different story once you open her up. She loves it and doesn't want to stop. 9 out of 10 in the comfort department. She's supremely comfortable. The seat is wide and forgiving, the bars are within easy reach and the protection from that screen and fairing are second to none. Built quality? Well, the bike earns itself 6 out of 10 and they do have some way to go before they can stamp the bike as high quality. As for value for money, well, it's a tricky one that, but I'll give it eight out of 10. It may not be the thoroughbred, but Italjet knows where it belongs in the marketplace. It does represent good value considering its capabilities. And that's enough of the Italjet. Let's now go back to Warren with another one of his Italian stallions. Well, thanks for that, Louise. And there you have it, the Italjet Jupiter, a quality, stylish little piece of commuting fun. But what about those of you who want a bit more speed with your Italian steed? Well, we've already checked out the 999, but maybe for some of you sticklers out there, that's not quite exotic enough. But what could be more exotic than a 999? Well, how's about one of these, an MV Agusta? A bike that sums up the Italian's passionate attitude towards sports bikes perhaps better than any other. We all know the Italians are fiendishly stylish, so it's no surprise to find the MV is quite possibly the most beautiful motorcycle yet to grace our insignificant little planet with its presence. Everything from the simple yet perfect silver and red paint job to the stunning lines of the tank and tail or the simple fact that despite being an inline four, the bike has the narrowness of a twin, leaves me knocked out every time. In sports bike land, bikes need to be able to put their money where their mouths are and that's that. And looking back into MV's company heritage, we find that early factory boss Count Domenico Augusta ran the place on the basis of racing success at the expense of the production line. A sound approach that saw MV atop the leaderboards worldwide back in their 1960s and 70s heyday. And this MV's broken right out of that same old mould, which makes it a proper little goer. True, a GSX-R 750 will leave it for dead in a straight line, while almost matching the sublime track mirrors. That's not quite the whole story. You see, the MV's true excellence lies in its handling. They're often set up on the very soft side of firm as they come from the factory, but get it set up right and one of the sharpest and purest handling packages in biking today is yours for the taking. Yowling round to a sky-high 17,000 RPM redline, this is a power plant that demands thrashing. There ain't much going on below 10,000 RPM, but from here on up there's plenty of poke and even a fair dose of torque to get things moving. 
So out of the final, scores on the doors look for the MV Augusta. Starting with performance, we're going to go for a 7 out of 10. That handling is absolutely sublime once you get it set up right. The motor does scream like a good one, but if I were being picky, I'd like a little more power out of it. Styling, 10 out of 10. It's as simple as that. This bike is a rolling work of art as proven by its position in the Guggenheim Museum. Comfort, 5 out of 10, and that's being very generous. It makes perfect sense at the track, but it'll kill you through town. Reliability, 5 out of 10. You buy one of these, you may never have a problem, but I think that's quite unlikely. Be prepared to keep some extra cash stashed aside just in case. Value for money, 6 out of 10. Again, you've got to be a rich bloke to own one of these, but if you've got the cash, you've got a very beautiful plaything on your hands. Still, she ain't cheap whichever way you look at it. So that's the MV Augusta, pure, unadulterated Sophia Loren sex on a stick. But despite all that, I have to say that against the 999, I'd still take the Duke any day of the week. Why? Because it's faster and it handles better. And that, for me, is what does it every time. But sadly, that is the end of part one. But please do join us again in part two when I will be checking out Aprilia's Tuono as another angle on Italian sports bikes. Louise will be giving you all the low-down tips that you need for buying an Italian bike. And Rod is going to be checking out a big old motor guzzi. See you then. Welcome back to part two of Bike File, where this week we're checking out the finest in Italian motorcycles. Coming up in the show, I'm going to be with this here Aprilia Tuono. But before we get there, it's time for Dr. Rod's big road test. So then, Rod, what have you got for us today? Motoguzzi's aren't everyone's cup of tea, but I have to admit to a certain fondness for the mark. The company have been pumping iron since 1921 and their trademark transverse V-twins have spawned few imitators. This V11 Sport is the latest in a line that started with the original V7 back in 1967 and includes such timeless icons as the original Le Mans. Now with a stunning performance at last year's TT under its belt, the V11 Sport demands your attention as a serious contender. And while this is a thoroughly modern bike, Motoguzzi have not turned their back on what made them successful in years past. The big grunty pushrod V-twin is still there, now bought out to 1064cc and equipped with fuel injection. A dry clutch and five-speed box links back to the trademark shaft drive, and the traditional Italian styling cue is all present and correct. What kicks this bike into the present is the reworked frame and suspension, which now features Marzocchi USD forks and fully floating Brembo Goldline brakes, and it handles too. Firm, taut suspension keeps you in touch with the road at all times and it doesn't jolt you out of the seat when the going gets rough. If I have any criticism, it's that the seat is rather too long and you can slide back and forth between the tank and seat hump every time you roll on the throttle. The handlebars and footrests are well positioned to let you enjoy the bike's performance and when you wind it on, it simply sounds lovely. And it should last. A Le Mans ancestor of this model won the gruelling 12,000 mile iron butt rally back in 93 and that bike is still in daily use. I've waxed lyrical about Guzzi's styling before but the sumptuous lines of this bike really do flow around that big chunky engine in a most satisfactory way. After a long day's hard ride you can sit outside a country pub sipping a pint and just taking the bike's looks while it ticks and cools. The V11 wouldn't be the model that I'd choose from Guzzi's catalogue. I like my cruisers too much for that. But given a choice between this and the latest Japanese road burner, the Guzzi wins hands down every time. So let's give it some scores. For performance, I'm going to score this bike at 7 out of 10. You can buy more speed and power for your money, but the big Guzzi will still be pumping strong when lots of younger bikes have fallen by the wayside. The handling was always good, but this latest V11 Sport plants itself solidly on the road and goes where it's pointed without drama. These bikes are stronger than the mere fashion statements you may find from other manufacturers, and the mixture of history and svelte good looks is rivalled only by other Italian bikes like Ducati. Comfort is pretty good too, with a riding position pitched more at traditional sporting stance than a spine-bending hypersports crouch. You can get your chin down on this bike if you must, but it's roomy enough to stretch a little when you need a break from scratching. Reliability should be pretty good on these bikes. The basic design is simple enough not to be plagued by techy electronic gremlins, and Guzzi have been making these things long enough to know how to bolt them together. And now from one big muscly brute to another. 
Here's water. Thanks for that, Rod. And now that we're all getting well into the swing of this and we're itching to go and blow some hard-earned wedge on an Italian stallion, wait. Because before we do, here's Louise with the top tips on buying Italian from the men in the know. Italian bikes are considered by many to be the Ferraris of the bike world. Renowned to be as fiery and expensive to maintain as Italian women, and as stunning to look at as a Leonardo da Vinci painting, but are Italian manufacturers recognised as brands that offer some of the sexiest and sportiest machines on the market? Well, Italian bikes um, have, have gone from strength to, strength to strength over the last few years. Um, like an Italian car, most of them are red. Um, they're very, very exotic. Um, very nice. Styling more than anything, it's, it's like if you go to any of the local bike hangouts, it's like going into a local nightclub, it's having an Armani suit just to cut above the rest. Stylish. They are just stylish. Um, everything about them, the way you look at them, the way you perceive them, will evoke an emotion. You can find them in art museums, design museums, design awards. They are very much style over function. They were not built the easy way, they were built to look beautiful. So if you're a poser and into the likes of Prada and Dolce & Gabbana, or a wealthy wannabe Sunday afternoon road racer, an Italian bike could be the ultimate designer fashion statement. But for most of us, owning more than one bike is an affordable luxury. So aside from looks and performance, you want to make sure that the bike you're about to part with your hard-earned cash for will do the job you want it to do. So are Italian bikes practical machines that can be used every day? Most Italian bikes are geared around performance super bikes, very, very fast. Um, but again, a super bike isn't practical, you know, for sort of nipping to the shops on. The racing crouch seating position isn't the most comfortable for the everyday commutee, and it would be impractical to offer Mandy from personnel a lift home from work, as these bikes are mostly single seaters. But are Italian bikes more reliable than their airport baggage handlers? Will you get from A to B without breaking down? Uh, some manufacturers have given the Italian bike scene a little bit of a bad reputation with sort of, you know, mechanically not the best thing in the world, but as far as we're concerned, if the bikes have been PDI'd properly and they go out the door, we never see a problem, they're, they're brilliant. The later bikes within the last five, seven years are a lot easier to own, they're a lot easier to maintain. So maybe Italian bikes offer more form than function. But apart from the minor electrical faults and the odd cam belt failure, they are generally reliable. And remember, all new bikes have at least one year's mechanical warranty. But the main appeal of owning an Italian bike is for its sporty pedigree. The blistering performance and tight grip needed to hold on will leave you picking your fingernails from the palms of your hands. So are they value for money? Well, as long as you don't mind suffering from saddle sore, I suppose they are. The way the bike looks is what drives quite a few people to own them, the aspiration to have one. When you go into your garage and you open it up and you take the cover off and it shines at you, no matter what the weather's doing, it's always it's going to be a good ride today. And that's it with your buying tips for Italian motorcycles. But enough of the boring anorak facts already because it's time to get back to the metal with this, Aprilia's Tuono. But what is it? Is it a retro? Is it a muscle bike? Who cares? There's no need to pigeonhole this bike. All you need to know is it's an absolute stormer. The formula that Aprilia have used to produce the Tuono is hardly a new one. After all, manufacturers have been ripping the fairings off their big sports bikes and slapping on flat bars for donkey's years now. But it's not the method that achieves the result that matters, it's the quality of the result they've ended up with. And in the case of the Tuono, you'll be pleased to know that quality is very good indeed. Why so good? Well, for starters, Aprilia have avoided blousing out and vastly detuning their superbike motor here before putting it in the Tuono. That's an absolutely marvellous thing. It might mean that you'll struggle a little bit above 120 mile an hour, but to be honest, who'd want to go there with just that little bikini fairing for company? The important thing to note is the motor is a stormer. Then there's the chassis. It's exactly the same as the standard RSV Millet, which as we know is one of the finest handling bikes you can buy out of the crates today. Handling this good is almost overkill on a bike like this. Only almost though. After all, 
you can never have too much of a good thing. And once you start throwing the Tuono about, you'll be very glad of the quality of handling that's available. You can take some serious cornering liberties and blast happily out the other side thanks to the safety blanket this chassis gives you. Throw in a riding position that handles town and everyday stuff as well as it does back road hammering, and you've got a very potent tool indeed, as it were. And then there are the wheelies. Oh boy, yes. So there you have it. Fun, stupidity, punchy motor, great handling all in one package. Tuono's absolutely rock. But now for the final conclusion. Starting with performance, the Tuono is going to get an 8 out of 10. It's not going to be the outright fastest bike on the market, thanks to the fact you're sat upright and kind of in the breeze. Although that little bikini fairing does do a very good job. Styling, I'm going to go for a 7 out of 10. I really like the way this bike looks, but not everyone agrees. There are other people out there who seem to think it looks like a pig in knickers. Comfort, 8 out of 10. Absolutely, supremely, beautifully, sumptuously comfortable. Reliability, 7 out of 10. That's a melee motor in there, and on the whole, they are generally very good. Although, on occasion, I have seen the old one here and there go pop under duress. Value for money. £7,300 for one of these is an absolute steal. 9 out of 10. So there we have it. Three very different ways of approaching the Italian sports bike theme. Between this lot, they'll all offer you some rather different things. Well, sadly, I'm sure I'm as gutted as you are because that's the end of this episode. But please join us again next week when we're going to be checking out the big tours of the biking world. Ron's going to be getting down and dirty with Harley's grand old Electroglide. Louise is going to be out maxi-scooting it on Honda's Silverwing. And in the meantime, I'm going to be mixing it up with Honda's Goldwing and BMW's K1200 LT. So until next time, we'll see you then.